the shooting range. In this episode, a forward swept wing, what, how, and why the hell, French pilots, Soviet yaks. We briefly remember the glorious story of the Normandy Neiman Regiment. Hotline, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with the patient hunter. We ride the new Big Light Panzer 57. The update 1.73 not only introduced French aviation to the game, what it also gave is the long-awaited rival for the BMP-1. Meet the Big Light Panzer 57. The tank with the 8.3 BR placed at tier 6 of the German tree. So, how is it different from all those other top vehicles? Let's figure it out. The main weapon of the Big Light Panzer is a 57mm ship cannon by Bofus that fires three types of ammo. At first, it looks kind of lame. Well, really, who needs a penetration maximum of 140mm at tier 6? But this is the main catch of the tank. It was created for those players who like frontal attacks. Its main purposes are reconnaissance and support. So, if you can't kill the enemy in front, outflank the guy. You've got the whole four magazines of 24 shells each that will destroy anything that's in your way. If your aim is good, of course. But what if there's no way to outflank the enemy? Get out them rockets, then. There are six guided TOW missiles that damage even the most protected targets at high distances. Nobody would like to hear that coming. Now, there are a few simple things to remember. The Big Light Panzer 57 is a light tank. That means you don't have enough armor to survive a single good shot. Also, keep in mind that you don't have any smokes, and the gun rotates kind of slowly, only 21 degrees per second. Another thing to think about is its speed. Technically, it can go as fast as 70 kph, but most of the time you'll be driving at about 40 to 50 kph. It's enough to keep up with your teammates, but you won't be able to beat everybody to the capture point. So what should you do with this one? Well, you've got three main tactics to pick from. First, all those flank moves that we've already talked about. Second, support your teammates from behind the front line, not from the actual front line. You can't survive that. If you don't like those two options, then you might find that the Big Light Panzer 57 is an ideal pick for ambushes of all sorts. Because who can survive six guided missiles and a quick-firing gun that can be effective even against enemy planes? That's right, nobody. Some time ago, you asked us in the comments to tell you about different types of wings, and that's what we're gonna do right now. Very briefly, of course. Why would you need a swept wing in the first place? To answer that, we'll return to the beginning of the monoplane era. This was the time when the aircraft designers discovered an unpleasant surprise. At a speed of about 500 kph, the planes faced a new force that wasn't there before. The air shockwave drag. Some of the air flows around the plane, especially around the wings, almost reached the speed of sound. At this point, the plane was going too fast for the air to elastically bypass it. So now, the air was hitting the aircraft with an incredibly heavy force, deforming and destroying the whole thing. Somehow, they had to make the wing resistant to this damage, or at least, delay the influence of the air shockwave effect. Pretty quickly, they thought of an idea to make the wing swept. That seemed to be enough. Now the plane entered still air, not at all at once, but kind of gradually. The air shockwave effect was partially gone, as the air started bypassing the wing instead of hitting it. However, the solution created an even more serious problem. 
The air bypassed straight wings in parallel with the x-axis of the aircraft, but with the swept ones, it moved sideways and accumulated at the wing tips. Now, imagine a plane in this condition trying to perform an aggressive maneuver. The thick boundary layer at the wing tips can instantly turn into a turbulent zone. This is called a stall. Now, it also happens with the straight wing planes. But the wing washout there ensures that the stall begins at the wing root. That way, the pilot has time to resolve the situation before the stall reaches the ailerons at the wingtips. And the plane with swept wings would immediately lose roll control in this situation because ailerons are useless in a turbulent flow. From there on, it's only seconds before an uncontrollable spin and crash. They've partially resolved this issue by inventing aerodynamic wing fences and fangs. But this disadvantage of a swept wing was never fixed for good. Then the engineers found a very simple solution for the problem. They'd only had to turn the wing around, making it swept forward. That way, the plane wouldn't lose at speed and the wingtip issue would be resolved for good because the stall in this construction would start at the wing root, where it would be easily handled. The idea was so tempting that every key aviation country in the world started messing with it. Planes with forward swept wings were created even sooner than the ones where the wings were clearly swept back. First tests were very promising, but then something went wrong again. It turned out that after gaining certain speed, the plane couldn't be used in any way except for an ideally direct flight. A slightest change in vertical direction resulted in almost immediate deformation and even destruction of the wings under an enormous pressure of the air facing it. Simply put, they call this the aerodynamic divergence. As if it wasn't enough, the wingtips at high speed started vibrating with an ever-increasing intensity until they actually crumbled. To fix all this, they had to make the wing with much more strong and basic materials. And that would mean a dramatic increase of the aircraft's weight. Aircraft designers all over the world are constantly trying to think of something that would fix the divergence problem. But the truth is, humanity still does not possess materials that strong to survive this kind of pressure. Still, the work continues. The forward swept wing is partially used in subsonic aviation. For example, here's a German business jet, the HBF 320 Hansa jet. As for the serial jet fighters, there are still none of those. But not for the lack of trying. For instance, the US tried it with the X-29 and an experimental modification of the F-16. And in Russia, they've created the Su-47 Berkut where they had tried using composite materials to solve the divergence problem. One of the newest Russian inventions is the SR-10, also an aircraft with forward swept wings. It is subsonic as well, but it works really well as a training machine for future fighter pilots, especially because of the unique properties of its wings. Another request from one of the viewers concerned the famous Normandy Nieman Regiment and how they fought in the USSR. Charles de Gaulle thought it imperative for the French servicemen to fight on all existing fronts of the Second World War. So the fighting French contacted the governments of the anti-Hitler coalition and offered to send them their own group of soldiers to fight for the common cause. The USSR also received such an offer and accepted it by the end of 1942. On the 4th of December, the first small group of French pilots and mechanics arrived at Ivanova to form a squadron called the Normandie. The name was chosen by the pilots themselves. They've also been granted a huge privilege compared to their Soviet colleagues. They could pick which machines to fly. The Soviet command offered them the best planes they had, from the Yak-1 and the LA-5 to the rebuilt Hurricanes 
the Aero Cobras and even the Spitfires. But the French chose to fly the Yaks. They thought them to be the closest thing to their own Moraine Saulnier 406 and the Duatin D520. Especially, the resemblance stood out in the engine area, because the Soviet engine M105P by Vladimir Klimov was an actual, though quite distant, descendant of the French Hispano Suiza 12 YBRS. And even though the Soviet variant of this engine was developed in its own way, the French air mechanics immediately understood everything about it. After getting used to the new machines, the squadron started flying their actual missions. At first, they didn't perform well for a number of reasons. Firstly, they were outnumbered by the Luftwaffe pilots. Secondly, the French were amazing pilots but lacked tactical skills. They were easily distracted by the enemy and preferred to fight each on his own, chasing personal records instead of working as a team and accomplishing the mission. Third problem was the language. Ever tried coordinating a team over the radio when half of the air consists of shouts en français and the others parouski? There were victories and there were losses. Only three of the first 15 French pilots made it to the victory day. But the French were fast learners and by the end of 1943, they became a powerful force and switched to the new Yak-9Ts. Still, the major turning point happened in the beginning of 1944. The Normandie regiment got the brand new fighters that seemed to look like the Yaks they'd got used to. But at the same time, it was something quite different. The Yak-3, the pinnacle of the Yak-1 concept, light as a feather, and with a kind of small battle radius, this tactical fighter outperformed everything they'd ever piloted. Simple statistics can't describe the hell that they've unleashed on the Luftwaffe pilots during the offensive operation in Belarusia. On the morning of the 15th of October, the squadron of Marcel Albert intercepted a formation of 20 Junkers 88 covered by six Gustavs. The French grounded six bombers and three fighters without any losses, leaving the Germans to flee in panic. A lucky day, you say? Hell, it was only the beginning. As early as the next day, they shot down 29 German planes without any losses. Everybody knew now who was in charge in the Eastern European skies. For the brave actions, the Normandie Regiment was awarded the name Niemann and from then on, it was only called the Normandie Niemann. Since that day, the French pilots never wanted to switch to any other plane. The little Yak-3 was the one for them, and the victory day was only half a year away. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments. The first question comes from a user called Burke Taylor. Will you ever add cross-platform gaming? Hey there, it's already been in the game for like three years or so. PC, PS4, Mac and Linux users can all play War Thunder together. The second question is by player Harry VJ. Will we ever see the HE-177 Griffin soon? Well, ever and soon are quite different, you know, but seriously, we remember about that one, and it'll make it to the game someday. Snaker Hash Gamer 87 begs War Thunder, por favor, crear un canal de YouTube en español para que se entienda, por favor, y gracias por leer esto. First of all, you're welcome. Second, we might get into it, but there's a good chance our editors will actually go crazy. Then there's a question from Lieutenant Miller USAF 42 Gaming. Is there a way to download match replays to the computer or system so that we can send you some sweet content to Thunder Show? There is. You can find the replays by clicking on the community and then replays. Also, it's all saved in the game folder. The quickest way to get there is by clicking a folder icon in the same replay menu. The last and very important question comes from a user called 
Stalonic 2000. When will I be able to fly ponies? Well, we'll see what we can do. No promises, though. This gameplay is way too advanced for the current balance. You know, friendship, magic, this is some serious business. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on The Shooting Range.